everyone. I am Alistair Stevens, and this is Story and Star Wars. After a long, unexpected hiatus, I am finally back to talk about Rogue One, a Star Wars story, and the beginning of a new, expanded Star Wars cinematic universe. Before we get to Rogue One, though, a couple of quick announcements. In the time since my last podcast lecture in this series, I have launched a brand new company, Point North Media. Story and Star Wars, as well as my other seminar and lecture series, will now be released under the Point North banner and will be available at pointnorthmedia.com. This endeavor is entirely supported by listeners like you, and if you would like to see more from Story and Star Wars, head on over to the Patreon page, patreon.com slash pointnorthmedia, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash pointnorthmedia, and pledge your support. I have big plans, which I'll talk about a little more at the end of the lecture, but the future of Story and Star Wars is absolutely in your hands. Rogue One was an immediate though of course not unanimous, critical success. It has made, to date, in excess of $1 billion off a budget of $200 million, and has definitively proved, I would argue, the viability of non-numbered Star Wars sequels, the so-called Star Wars anthology titles. Based on a story by John Knoll and Gary Whitta, the script was written by Chris Weitz and Tony Gilroy. It was directed by Gareth Edwards, and though the production was somewhat troubled, the final movie is, I think, an impressively self-aware perspective on the Star Wars universe. It isn't, by any means, a perfect film. There are structural problems, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, which may alienate the audience and render the core narrative somewhat less impactful than it might otherwise be. But in general, I think, it is a film which is extremely mindful of the story which it sets out to tell and commits to that core narrative with an impressive, almost unparalleled dedication. More on that at the end of the lecture. Let's begin then at the beginning. Rogue One deviates from the standard structure of Star Wars movies in a number of interesting ways, and it is clear from the opening moments that the choice to title the movie A Star Wars Story rather than Star Wars Episode 3.5 is more than just a marketing decision. It informs essential elements of the movie's structure and style, including the absence of an opening crawl and the inclusion of a cold open. The purpose of the crawl, from A New Hope all the way to The Force Awakens, is to bring the audience into a story which is already unfolding, even if that unfolding story doesn't yet actually exist. Even the opening crawl for The Phantom Menace, as I discussed way back in that lecture, exists in part to give the sense of unfolding history. The story is already in motion, and we are joining it. That is structurally true for Rogue One 2, of course. We come into the story with Galen Erso and Krennic, their history already established, their relationship already fraught. But the absence of a crawl tells us, in part, that this is, if not the beginning, then at least a beginning. The story, for us, is not yet in motion. Far more important than the absence of a crawl, though, is the opening shot of the movie. It has been said that the tone of each Star Wars film is established in part by their opening sequences, and there is perhaps no more stirring example of that than in A New Hope. The Star Destroyer Devastator pursues Princess Leia's corvette, and the entire dynamic between the Empire and the Rebels is established in that one sequence. The Empire, vast, unstoppable, all-powerful. The Rebels, tiny, scrappy, hopeful. The sense of scale imparts an enormous amount of tonal and thematic information, as well as being, of course, immediately arresting and engaging. We might also think of the opening shot of The Force Awakens and the dark silhouette of the Star Destroyer against, almost cleaving through, the planet. The intrusive, violent intersection of darkness, of legacy, and the galaxy and the era of the New Republic. Again, tonal and thematic information presented visually. The opening moments of Rogue One are very different. Krennic's shuttle is dwarfed by the planet, and that sense of scale continues to dwarf the characters throughout the entire story. Krennic lands across the fields from Galen's farm, and he and his men have to walk across the vast landscape to begin the action. The sense of space is palpable and oppressive. These are small people in a very large world, not the focal points of galactic history.' 
that doesn't undermine the importance of the things that these characters will achieve, but it sets our expectations beautifully. No one here will be recorded by history. Their greatest accomplishments, though necessary to the unfolding of a galactic epic, will be only a footnote. From the first, we are cued to expect a story of a smaller, more intimate scale. But, crucially, a story that still inhabits, still occupies, still, in a sense, fills the galaxy-spanning frame established by the previous Star Wars movie. This is not an incidental story, though these are incidental characters. We see echoes of that sense of space and scale throughout the movie, in every possible direction. The looming presence of the Star Destroyer hanging in the air above the holy city of Nijeda in exactly the way, to borrow from Douglas Adams, that bricks don't. The hard contrasts of scale between the raid on the surface of Scarif in the last act of the movie, which shifts rapidly in scale itself as the climax of the movie unfolds, and the events in orbit over the planet are jarring and turned to decisive and beautiful effect in the movie's closing moments. We might even consider the character of Krennic as further proof of this mastery of scale. Over the course of this series, we've encountered leaders from both sides of the imperial-rebel divide, and they have been, generally speaking, impressive, assured, powerful. Krennic is, deliberately and consciously, not He's a petty bureaucrat, a career politician, a small man in a large galaxy concerned with his position and his career. Unlike Palpatine or Vader, he's not driven by philosophy. Unlike Tarkin, with whom he is conspicuously contrasted throughout the movie, he does not possess a steely competence, a will to endure and to triumph. Krennic is an antagonist who is perfectly suited to the scale of this story, Though I think it is fair to observe that his relative weakness does the movie no narrative favors. He is strong thematically, but somewhat less so in the sense of the underlying narrative structure. He is malevolent, but it's an unfocused kind of antagonism that doesn't always anchor the core conflict as it should. He is dangerous, but less in a specific primary way than perhaps he should be. This is demonstrated, underscored, emphasized by the movie itself in the way that he is repeatedly eclipsed when we turn to secondary antagonists for a real sense of threat. First Tarkin, then Vader, then ultimately to what he thinks of as his own creation, the Death Star itself. Throughout this movie, Krennic is dwarfed. When we're talking about scale, we should also talk about the decision to begin the story with young Jin Erso and the recovery of Galen Erso by Imperial forces. This is an atypical structural choice for Star Wars. And though it might be argued that the prologue is unnecessary, it does serve to motivate part of the primary conflict. In a sense, and this is an incomplete sense because of the structural shifts in the story as a whole, Rogue One is the story of Jin and Galen, daughter and father. To the degree to which that is true, the prologue serves the story well by beginning the action at the moment of separation. To the degree that the movie is not about Jin and Galen, the prologue is unnecessary. And we could instead begin with any one of a handful of scattered scenes through the first act. The arrival of the Imperial defector Rook on Jeddah, Cassian learning of the planet killer weapon, Jin being rescued. Any one of those scenes would work as the inciting incident for the part of this story that is not the father-daughter story. Part of the problem which afflicts this movie is a certain lack of clarity concerning that core conflict, and thereby confusion as to our primary protagonist-antagonist relationship. Jin is the most obvious protagonist, but her ability to drive and direct the action is somewhat compromised by the movie's shift into and out from her POV. And the conflict anchored in the relationship with her father is not always the movie's primary concern. The other side of the story, regarding the Death Star plans, the rebellion, the desperate attack on Scarif, shares the spotlight between Jin and Cassian Andor, who is at least as much a protagonist in that side of the story as Jin is. Jin is reactive in that side of the plot as the story begins. She is incarcerated, freed, compelled to undertake this mission, and bounces through the plot for arguably the first half of the story. 
Then she does take charge of the core narrative for a while, and then ultimately plays her part in the ensemble through the last act of the movie. But Jin Erso is no Ray. She doesn't drive the action in the same way. This is a movie from which the kind of heroes that we normally associate with Star Wars are all but entirely absent. In a broader sense, Rogue One renders the core conflict in archetypal terms. It is, in part, the story of rebels versus the Empire, or, more specifically, rebellion in the abstract versus totalitarian authority in the abstract. The ability of the movie to navigate those shifts in tone is admirable, though perhaps never quite seamless. Jin's impassioned speech about the nature of rebellion is powerful, is extraordinary, drives us into the last act of the movie with a propulsive kineticism, but it is perhaps a little less motivated, a little less personal than we would like. So let's gloss the structure. We begin with the prologue and then move into the first act with a scattered collection of scenes that feel, every time I watch this film, somewhat fragmentary. Rook, Cassian, Jin, the rebel headquarters on Yavin 4. By the time we set our immediate goal, the goal that drives us into the second act, contacting Saw Gerrera on Jeddah, we are 20 minutes into the movie, and I can't quite shake the feeling that those 20 minutes have been somewhat formless, somewhat shapeless, a series of disconnected scenes that haven't yet culminated in anything. The first act ends with the arrival of Jin on Jeddah and the first glimpse of the Star Destroyer floating over the Holy City. The second act focuses on Jeddah, and the third begins after the destruction of the Holy City and Jin's flight from Sogarera's fortress and the transition to Edo. This occurs roughly 45 minutes into the movie. Events on Edo, including Galen Erso's attempted self-sacrifice and ultimate death, and the return to the rebel base, carry us through the third act, ending with Jin's impassioned speech and the assembling of the ensemble that will carry us through to Scarif, the fourth and final act. We then conclude with the notorious epilogue featuring Darth Vader. So while the movement of the story works in broad strokes, it does leave us with breaks, which suspend and stall character arcs, and shift, it would seem unintentionally, the emphasis of the core conflict. The first act is about Jin being conscripted into the rebellion. The second connects her with her surrogate father, Saw Gerrera, and indirectly to her actual father, Galen. The third act resolves the Jin-Galen plot with Cassian as a secondary antagonist. The fourth act unites the ensemble in rebellion against the Empire. It is the most straightforward and speaks most directly and most powerfully to what is, I think, an unexpected inspiration for a Star Wars story. The classic ensemble war movies, going all the way back to movies like The Dirty Dozen. Each of these stories is strong, though the first is, as I've said, arguably the least successful, but they don't quite unify into a single comprehensive narrative. This remains a film of constituent parts, though it must be said that the impact of the fourth act, the final breathtaking battle of Scarif, goes a long way toward asserting a powerful narrative vision that retroactively drags and unifies the first three acts into something resembling a whole. This is a movie that is, more than most, defined by its ending. We should also acknowledge that for all the textual inconsistency in terms of structure and focus, there is also a fair measure of intertextual inconsistency, particularly when we look at information and communication. Time and space are more collapsed within this movie than in, I think, any other Star Wars film. There are a few odd contrivances, such as Rook arriving on Jeddah just before Jin and Cassian. The mechanics of data ownership and communication are pivotal to the core plot, and yet remain somewhat unclear and out of focus. Immediate communication across great distances is apparently possible, as has been established before in Star Wars. As has also been established, there is a singular, existential quality to data that results in the key importance of actual tapes, the physical artifacts of an analog, pre-digital culture. In this sense, Rogue One plays homage to A New Hope, without seeking to resolve any of the inevitable issues which arise. It is more concerned with being consistent with the saga than it is with being internally consistent. But there are some ways in which Rogue One's dialogue with A New Hope is much, much more interesting and successful. 
Back when I discussed A New Hope, I spent a little time looking at the actual heart of the story and how it contradicted, how it stood in open conflict with the movie's explicit attempt to encapsulate its own theme. For those of you who have forgotten, and it has been 18 months or so since then, the theory goes like this. During the assault on the Death Star, Luke turns off his targeting computer and trusts in the Force. He doesn't, crucially, use the Force, to borrow a phrase that will become mimetic in the discussion of Star Wars. Rather, he surrenders his impulse to heroism and moves toward harmony with the Force, thereby achieving success. The Force, it seems throughout the first movie, is less a tool that can be put to specific use and more a means of finding harmony and unity with oneself and with the universe around you. This isn't necessarily true through the rest of the series when the Force turns into a collection of magical superpowers, though it is certainly true and fair that both Yoda and Qui-Gon Jinn nod toward the same idea. This is obviously extremely significant within the frame of Rogue One, particularly as represented by the character of Chirrut Imwe. The blind man's unity and harmony with the Force has been seen by some as a stark redefinition of the way the Force works. But I see it as being, itself, completely harmonious with that original concept. Chirrut Imwe has achieved what Luke set out to achieve. He has integrated the movement of the Force so completely that his actions are utterly in accord with the demands of the moment. Moreover, he has found within that integration a peace and certainty about the motivations of his actions, which stand in direct opposition to either the roguish tangle of impulse and virtue that we see in characters like Han Solo, and the blazing impulse toward heroism that we see from characters like Luke Skywalker. Even the perspective of the Jedi Council in the prequel trilogy, where we talk more explicitly of the harmonious nature of the Force, seems thin and insubstantial by comparison, even hypocritical as that trilogy moves toward its final moments. Chirrut Imwe's I am one with the Force and the Force is with me is a key reframing of our own personal relationship with the Force, and it builds beautifully on the now fragmentary seeming May the Force be with you. This may possibly intersect with one of the primary themes of Rogue One, that rebellion and hope are intertwined. This is an interesting and and provocative and moving idea, but it may expand under scrutiny to encompass an even larger idea. There is a difference between specific hope and abstract hope, between active hope and passive hope, if you like. The difference between, I hope this plan works out, which is specific and active, and I have hope that tomorrow is better than today, which is abstract and passive. Specific hope may inspire individuals to take specific action, but rebellion is not a state necessarily of specific action. Taking arms against a powerful foe requires, at a foundational level, A simple belief that good can triumph, that evil can be defeated, that tomorrow can be better than today. That certainly seems to be the way that the word hope is used in Rogue One's most powerful moments, and it speaks to this recurring idea that harmony with the Force is simply the greatest desirable virtue. Another word for that kind of abstract hope, by the way, might be faith. Certainly, it might be said that rebellions can be based more readily on faith than on specific, active hope. This is emphasized still further when, at the end of the third act of Rogue One, the Rebel Alliance fractures and refuses to take decisive action in pursuit of the Death Star plans on Scarif. This seems, parenthetically, to be an extraordinary turn of events. Everything we know about the Rebel Alliance tells us that they will fight the Empire to the end, but we must remember that Rogue One takes place prior to the dissolution of the Senate. There is still, at this point, hope for a diplomatic resolution to the tyrannies of the Empire. That won't be true for very much longer. But when the rebels refuse to rebel, hope and faith are enough to double down on the notion of rebellion, to see Jin and the others undertake a voluntary suicide mission. It may be argued that if rebellions are built on hope, then it is equally, almost axiomatically true to say that hope necessarily manifests itself as rebellion. It's also worth noting that the quality contrasted with hope throughout Star Wars, though never more eloquently than in Rogue One, is fear. 
Do you have faith that tomorrow will be better than today? Do you fear it will be worse? If the latter is true, then you will inevitably try to exert control to prevent your feared outcome from occurring. If you believe the former, then you will have no reason to try to exert control. This is, again, axiomatically the basis of every political argument and conflict in human history. Control to prevent the worst, or freedom to encourage the best. This is also, obviously, the fundamental conflict between the empire, which seeks not only to control, but to actively use fear as a means of control, again doubling down on a core concept, and the rebel alliance. There is another interesting reflection on A New Hope contained within the text of Rogue One, though I'm a little less certain of this one. Following Jin's departure to Jeddah, we have a brief scene between Saw Gerrera and Rook. By this time, we've been told that Gerrera has splintered from the rebellion. He is a fanatic who is pursuing an extreme form of the rebel agenda. At one point, Guerrera pulls his breathing mask from his suit and inhales deeply. We cut to Rook's face, but we hear some prominent and familiar deep breathing. I've talked before about the best, purest form of the prequel trilogy story, in which Anakin's excess of determination and virtue, his almost vicious desire to protect those that he loves, are responsible directly for his fall to the dark side of the Force. I'm struck here by parallels between Anakin and Guerrera, two men who served the forces of good and justice until they fell, to a greater or lesser degree, into darkness. They are both, it would seem, ultimately redeemed prior to their deaths, and while I won't make for a moment the argument that Guerrera's plot is as developed even as Anakin's is, there is an echo in the narrative that I find fascinating, and which, I must confess, I have not yet been able to entirely unpick. I would like to discuss this further, so if you have thoughts and insights on this subject, please get in touch. Since we're on the subject of Saw Gerrera and his extremist faction, we should probably acknowledge some potentially problematic representations of race and ethnicity in Rogue One. While the movie should be commended for being, by some distance, the most diverse and progressive Star Wars movie thus far, there is, I think, an uncomfortably clear and prominent connection between the cultures and aesthetics of Jeddah and real-world locations and peoples. When Guerrera's rebels attack the Imperial forces within the Holy City, it is impossible not to be immediately reminded of footage, both documentary footage and fictional footage, concerning terrorist and rebel attacks in the Middle East. This is a part of what seems to me to be an informed and thoughtful conversation about terrorism as a political act, which runs throughout Rogue One. This is a conversation that has spilled out from The Force Awakens, in part. But the specific combination of action and aesthetic in the sequence may leave the viewer uncomfortable as to the movie's perspective on Guerrera. He is an extremist, but he is also, even primarily, a rebel. We're leaning toward an implicit narrative that equates the rebels, even in this extremist form, with Islamic terrorists, and thus the Empire, even in their own extremist form, with what we might inaccurately and incompletely describe as the United States. And here's the thing. That is a powerful image, and it is somewhat compelling, but it is also fractured. It, too, is incomplete. It has been observed that the forces of good and evil in A New Hope, throughout the original trilogy, in fact, are absolutely unambiguous. Luke wears white, Vader wears black, the good guys are good and the bad guys are not. The closest we get to moral ambiguity is Han Solo with his white shirt and black vest, and his roguish impulses seem adorably simple, naive, prosaic in the context of modern storytelling in general, and Rogue One in particular. Even at his worst, Han Solo is a pretty classic hero. That might imply that the social circumstances surrounding A New Hope were equally straightforward, but that has never been true. George Lucas himself has spoken more than once about the parallels between the Empire and the United States in the wake of Vietnam. So it might seem like an obvious extension of the rebel narrative in the Star Wars series to look more directly at terrorism, rebellion, conflict in the Middle East, as we did, in part, in The Force Awakens. 
But I would be wary of drawing such a clean connection, even given the unfortunately obvious aesthetic, geographical, and apparent sociocultural similarities between the real-life Middle East and Jeddah. As I discussed during the lecture for The Force Awakens, we must be aware not only of the shape of the thing, but the direction it is facing, the use to which it is being put. And the truth is that Guerrera's extremism is all but entirely informed. A read of the story's movement, the shape of the story as opposed to the text of the story, makes it clear that his plotline isn't really about extremism at all, but simply about factionalism. The rebel alliance is splintered. We need Jin to bridge one of those divides, to rebuild a trust. But we're not talking about the condemnation of extremist acts, the condemnation of fanatics, but those who have splintered from a political union. There's no reason, if Guerrero's extremism is narratively significant and not simply a placeholder to serve the story's structure, why that extremism shouldn't be demonstrated. And while Guerrero's forces are more militant and antagonistic than what we see of the rest of the Rebel Alliance, it's only by the slimmest of margins. Lest we forget, this is a story which practically begins with Cassian murdering an informant. Ultimately then, I do not think that the Guerrera subplot is particularly offensive or particularly emphatic on any particular point, despite the appearance of such things. But as such, it does stand as something of a missed opportunity. In the end, Saw Guerrera's entire plot, the entire second act of this film, is fairly hollow. Finally, of course, Rogue One ends as it was always going to, by moving into the action of A New Hope. The suicide mission narrative of the final act is, for me, definitively the most successful part of the movie. Hope may be the foundation of rebellion, but here we learn that rebellion can endure even when hope has been lost. K2's sacrifice buys Cassian and Jin entrance to the vault and time, Chirrut's sacrifice buys an opportunity to transmit the message. Baze's sacrifice is an act of vengeance and of justice, though his role after the death of Chirrut is interesting because, in part, of the dualistic nature of these two characters. Throughout the final act, the sense of impending doom is palpable. It creates a tension point between our natural inclination toward narrative justice, our heroes are the good guys, they'll succeed and they'll survive, and the story's emphatic, doom-laden commitment toward internal consistency, a kind of narrative purity. This is a story that knows, throughout the final act and to a somewhat lesser extent throughout the entire movie, exactly what it is. It moves with purpose and with integrity, and it ends the only way that it possibly can, with Jin and Cassian facing, embracing death, with the hope of a brighter tomorrow. From the moment that Cassian returns from the dead to incapacitate Krennic and save Jin, at which point we cut away to the broken Star Destroyers shattering the shield ring above the planet and the music rises, the Death Star arrives and Tarkin orders the base be destroyed, the sense of valiant futility permeates every moment, every frame. It is, in a movie that is often a little compromised, a little confused, a sequence of unparalleled beauty, of unparalleled heroism, and what is most impressive, conscious and deliberate intent. As Jin and Cassian collapse on the sand, looking out over the water, there is no romantic spark between the two. Just an acknowledgement from Cassian that Galen would have been proud, a final beat of resolution to Jin's story. They embrace, we see Jin's eyes fill with something approaching hope, a new hope, and then it is over. I am incredibly moved and impressed by the end of the story, and I have enormous respect for the purity of this vision. This is the only way, the only way, that Rogue One could end in a satisfactory manner. From there, we move into the epilogue, which is Visually impressive, but narratively somewhat superfluous, Vader tears apart the rebel crew, the information barely escapes, making it into the hands of a CGI Princess Leia, and into both the future and the past, and, either way, into myth and into legend. 
Now that the rogue crew has fallen, there really is a new hope. There is a lot more to be said on the subject of Rogue One, the symbolism of Jin's crystal, for example, the duality of Chirrut Imwe and Bayes Malbus, the mechanics of the five- and the seven-man band, the role and representation of K2SO, mechanism and mundanity in the depiction of technology, even the challenges and opportunities of Rogue One's place in Star Wars canon and continuity. But that is a conversation for another time. So for now, let's consider this a Rogue One Part 1 kind of lecture, and I'll return in the near future with a second podcast in which I can pick up on some of those outstanding threads and move, I think, into a little more detail. If you have questions, thoughts, comments, ideas, please email me at pointnorthmedia at gmail.com or come find me on Twitter at pointnorthmedia. In the meantime, and to conclude this lecture... I would say that Rogue One stands as a narrative accomplishment which, while imperfect, succeeds at such an elemental level, with such mindfulness and specificity, that it almost completely escapes the burden of its flaws. Time will tell if this movie will set a template for the other Star Wars anthology movies. I suspect, in all honesty, that it will not. But I am glad that this story has been told with such clear purpose— even if I wish that some of that purpose hadn't been preserved until the final act of the story. Before we wrap up then, a reminder that Story and Star Wars is entirely listener-supported. If you would like more of these lectures and discussions more often, then head on over to patreon.com slash pointnorthmedia and pledge a dollar a month or whatever you can afford. Your support is the only thing that can keep this endeavor going, and I am enormously grateful. As extra incentive, I am planning a Story and Star Wars review of the Clone Wars animated movie, as well as moving into the Clone Wars and Rebels TV series. Also, I have something very special planned. At some point in the not-too-distant future, I want to run a live-tweet marathon of every live-action Star Wars movie to date in release chronological order in a single day. We would start at something like 6am with A New Hope and run all the way through to Rogue One, live-tweeting, offering commentary and insight and probably probably making some dumb jokes along the way. If you would like to see that happen, as well as more story and Star Wars content in your podcast app of choice, visit patreon.com slash pointnorthmedia. And visit pointnorthmedia.com for ongoing discussion series looking at the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, in which we are, as of this recording, about to begin The Fellowship of the Ring, and American Gods, both Neil Gaiman's seminal novel and the upcoming Stars TV adaptation, as well as much, much more. That'll do it for this time. I've been Alistair Stevens. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon with Rogue One Part 2. May the Force be with you.